Well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge all my colleagues, uh, both at Notre Dame and at uh, NOS and uh, NSEP. Uh, we've been a big integrated team working on this project. And this is really focused on uh, coastal flooding. So that really is the inner shelf as well as the whole coastal floodplain. And it's a, a project that's focused on process as well as scale integration. So we go from about 24 kilometers in the deep ocean to the intricate uh, uh, coastal uh, channel systems, which are very dendritic uh, at about 30 meters of resolution right now. And it's really a very high fidelity representation of all US coastal waters and we're building in a capacity in other portions of the world as well. So essentially the forcing functions that dominate in this coastal region are the tides and they're driven by tidal potential functions. We don't need any boundary functions and something called self-attraction and load tides. The uh, weather is uh, forced with GFS FV3. We use uh, right now GFS ice coverage. And this is a 2D model and, and you can see some of the unstructured finite element discretization on the right. We also uh, drive bear clinic pressure gradient terms so that we can get coastal currents. And we get that information by hooking into the HICOM GR TOFS based model. And we can model seasonal variability and steric water levels, uh, warming cold core eddies, et cetera. Uh, we're also working on coupling into Wave Watch 3 uh, as well as the hydrology from the national water model. So I'll really split my talk and overview of this work into three different parts the high resolution coastal meshing and modeling of the US coast then the global mesh and the, the global tidal physics, and then this whole novel way of doing bare clinic pressure gradient forcing and get, getting the 3D ocean climatology into the coastal regions. So first of all, the, the, as I mentioned, the resolution varies between 30 and or 120, depending on which version of these models that we're building in about 24 kilometers. And we really focus on capturing this whole dendritic, dendritic network of of channels, intricate coastal bays, barrier islands, jetties, topographic gradients, deep draft channels, all that stuff that makes the coastal zone uh, breathe in and out the, uh, the ocean water as well as hydrology. And uh, a big piece of this uh, effort was put in getting a very accurate coastline that aligned with the best DMs that are available. And that really involves getting CUSP together, NHD and US medium shoreline into one continuous, massively uh, highly resolved uh, database of the US coastlines. Um, we use uh, the latest uh, unstructured meshing technology. A lot of it we've built ourselves in a model called Ocean Mesh 2D. Uh, and uh, we separate out the ocean side as well as the water side, the, the ocean slash water side and the land side because we do mesh over the coastal floodplain. Obviously, this is a coastal inundation model as well. Uh, we use a whole host of characterizations, including standard ones like wavelength, uh, topographic length scale, fall wave identification, and, and a lot of new, uh, novel things like medial axes and min-max functions along shorelines and element growth limiters to really automatically and very accurately uh, mesh that. So a typical example is right over here. This is the east coast of the U.S. Gulf Coast component. And you can see this is the ocean side or water side only. You can see that whole network of channels extending into land so we can hook in uh, the whole coastal floodplain with the, uh, ocean, with the uh, national water model for the hydrology. Some typical examples are here, South Carolina inlets. Um, you see the left side is a 30 meter, meter rendition. 120 to the right, uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, looking, zooming in a little bit more detail there, you can see much more uh, resolution over there, and, and zooming in even, even further, you capture an enormous amount of this coastal floodplain, which is subject to fl flooding, especially when these things are laying in low-lying areas. Um, so a typical example of a 120 meter rendition would be over here. This model is going operational that you see uh, here's the ocean side, and then we mesh the land side, and together those make the coastal U.S. part of this mesh. Uh, some examples over here in terms of hindcast, Hurricane Irma. Um, you can see the uh, the red is the Abcirc, which is Abcirc and Swan, 
is the models we use, they're the models we built and have been operational at NOAA for a long time. Um, and uh, you can see a little bit of a shift uh, at the, uh, after the storm passes. Uh, Irma had a lot of water being pushed away from the coast, and, and we have a little bit of a downset in the mean water level. That, those are actually Bear Clinic uh, effects, and, and part three of my talk will address that. And you can see at the coast and inland, we're doing very well, but again, you can see that little bit of a shift. That's actually due to, to upwelling um, of, and downwelling of, coast, of ocean waters onto the shelves. And uh, the, here, going up St. John's River, you can see there's a, some missing physics. It's that we're not hooked into the hydrology yet, and that's what we're planning on doing. That's a very important part that's become increasingly uh, important for us to be able to do that. Uh, waves are computed very nicely, as here's some examples from significant wave height, and uh, you going inland, you can see even better. Uh, going near shore, you can see that the results are consistently good. This is important to us because the wave radiation stresses provide extra uh, forcing for currents as well as for setup of coastal waters. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the global component of this whole system. Um, a global shell really allows us to seamlessly insert and integrate in one unstructured mesh the whole world. And so that those high resolution meshes are embedded right, not nested, but embedded right in a, one unified global mesh. And so you really are truly are going from 24 to 30 meter resolution in one uh, large me mesh. And it really improves robustness and accuracy to do it in an integrated seamless way. And also it's a much better way to maintain models instead of having all these nests that have to talk to each other. And uh, so certainly uh, the design here is to have this integrated strategy. I had to do a lot to go global. Uh, EdCERC has a long history in regional modeling and we went global. Uh, we do have a lot of our of kind of fun tricks up our sleeves. Uh, for example, we reoriented North Pole so that the North Pole is now in, uh, in uh, Greenland to avoid the uh, spherical, um, spherical singularity that we have in the system. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we basically have a lot of, uh, um, again, the same unstructured meshing packages that we've developed uh, that we use for this. Uh, it turns out that global bathymetry was very, very important and, uh, and, and topography. Over here, you can see that we have a lot of extra resolution wherever there are mountain ridges as well as shelves. And, and so that turned out to be a very important factor to get this global model to work right because there's a lot of internal tide generation and dissipation there. Another feature that was very important was to get the best bathymetry available. We used GEPCO 2020, but we had to use the a special Antarctic database and that made enormous differences in terms of how we computed uh, tides around the world and especially in the Atlantic and we used had to use high resolution uh, Hudson Bay and Labrador Sea uh, bathymetry from the Canadians even though that bathymetry is uh, upscaled in the GEPCO data set. So uh, it turns out that we have great results and uh, here are the uh, is the complex error for the M2 tide Bottom line is that we're much more accurate than any non-data simulated model out there by at least a factor of two, but up to a factor of four. So you can see some of the results for the different tidal constituents globally here, and we have an extremely accurate global model that we continue to refine and improve. And of course, the more regional and coastal bathymetry we get in there, the better. The last part I'd like to talk about is the uh, bare clinicity as a, as a driver. Uh, again, I, I said this is a 2D model. Essentially, we're, what we're trying to buy is much more coastal resolution instead of having 3D. Uh, a lot of the coastal processes are predominantly 2D, uh, but if we were to go 3D, we would lose our ability to provide that high resolution in the coastal zone. So we were running really the, in, uh, the uh, external mode component then of a modeling system. And what we do is we go to the HICOM model in order to compute this bare clinic pressure gradient term. That's dependent on density. So we pull temperatures and salinity from HICOM, and then we compute in, vertically integrate them and we complete, compute the bare clinic pressure gradient term. We also force the internal tide dissipation model uh, that we have embedded into this with those same densities. And, and this is what you get. You get a very nice uh, 
um, uh, for example, Gulf Stream going over here. This is surface water elevation. You can see the water being pulled away. The blue indicates lower water levels from the East Coast. And of course, as the Gulf Stream slows down, uh, you, get, uh, um, you get much higher coastal water levels along the East Coast. So it's a very important part of our model. And you get the steric winter, summer, uh, expansions and contractions, et cetera. You get the effect of cold and warm core eddies, et cetera, in this. Uh, we compare extremely well with GLOFs in terms of doing this. So their results in terms of all the parameters of what the current systems and water levels look like are very, very similar to ours. And again, we're downscaling their salinity and temperature information. And at a very, very small cost, we're including all that vericlinicity. Um, going around the world, uh, what does this do to mean sea levels, 30-day mean average? Uh, you can see the black line is the observed in, in North Carolina here. Uh, the red line is when we pull those bariclinic pressure gradient terms, and the blue line is when we ignore them and have a purely barotropic model. So you can kind of see a, a mixed set of, uh, a mixed influence there of barotropic and bariclinic. Uh, very similar in Pensacola. We don't have enough resolution on the uh, Florida shelf yet, so we're improving that. And, and that will uh, be with that inset. And over here in Kaloa in South America, you can see that uh, the uh, black line again is the measured. The blue line is the barotropic signal. So it's very bariclinically dominated over there. So, uh, and it works really well. Um, Nome, Alaska is very barotropically dominated and doesn't make much of a difference. Kind of an interesting uh, little thing to, to finish up on over in here. This is uh, in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico in our models and uh, you can see a tidal signal over here and here you can see uh, Hurricane uh, Maria and Irma and um, you can see over here here's a mean average signal and what you can see the black line is the the measured uh, uh, filtered signal just so you can uh, uh, see what that uh, um, surface water elevation and there's a very pronounced depression uh, of the uh, of sea level after the storm after uh, Irma passed. And um, what you can see is uh, that uh, um, the, uh, the barotropic model, which is the blue, doesn't capture that at all. When you add the bariclinic terms, you, you capture that very nicely. And in fact, much better than HICOM. So the HICOM has much more of a depression. And, and that's actually cold water upwelling from the deep ocean that occurred as the storm passed. Uh, mean sea level is also very nicely represented uh, here on a 30-day running mean average. You can see the red line is this barotropic model that we, we basically run very cheaply by hooking into GRTOS slash HICOM. And we, in fact, do a much better job than HICOM at these coastal water levels because their resolution is so poor. The other really interesting thing is that uh, we get a much better spectrum when we do a, a power spectrum density. Um, you can see that the whole spectrum is lifted up to the black, which is the measured uh, uh, PSD, and uh, the blue is the barotropic model. This is this new uh, hybrid uh, HICOM ADSERC bariclinic model. So we get a much better representation. Um, to finish up here, we, the roadmap for the ADSERC is uh, to uh, couple not only GF, uh, GFFE3 and, and HICOM, uh, but also we uh, have a whole bunch of projects that are uh, or steps towards and projects towards coupling to Wave Watch 3, sea ice, as well as uh, the national water model. Um, last but not least, we're going operational and the uh, GSTOS is the Global Extropical Surge and Tide Operational Forecast System. It has gone through extensive testing and is uh, very close to uh, being able to go operational and you can see the websites there. That's what I have. Great, thank you very much. We have one minute. Do we have any questions? Yes, we have a question on Slack from Robert Hallberg. Uh, how tolerant is the combined ADSERC ICOM system to discrepancies in the topography used by the two models? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the main drivers in ADSERC are still barotropic, so you don't tend to, uh, uh, to get a huge influence uh, based on there being a variability. So all we're getting from them is their, their uh, bariclinic pressure gradient term. So we're getting their density and their, uh, their uh, 
we're getting their density and uh, uh, or through temperature and salinity. My alarm just went off. But uh, so it's very tolerant and uh, very, very robust. And in fact, the global integration of all this is much more robust than, than the regional models because we don't have to deal with any of the um, any of the boundaries. Now, if we try to do this with regional models, then we do have some trouble because uh, the let's say the warm core eddies and cold core eddies got, uh, with that uh, spin off of a current system, uh, they're different between two, two models and we have a lot of trouble with boundary conditions. So it's just ideally suited to be in this global framework, which is why another one of the many reasons why we like it so much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we are out of time now. So um, next we have we have um, Giande Wang, verification of the ocean state in the UFS coupled system. Okay, can people hear my voice? Okay, yes, we see okay. your slides. Yeah, I'm on slides. Okay, so my name is Jenda Wama from EMC. Today I'm going to talk about the validation of all she means states in the WAF or UFSS stress vortex called 3.1. First, I want to show my acknowledgement to all my colleagues. This is really a monster size project that involves. Many, many people and different organizations. Here I list all of my internal co workers, and in my end of slide, I'll show all those external organizations. So, my other is um, first, I'm going to talk briefly about a couple of models and uh, what's our project runs and uh, show all of those validation of ocean mistakes. Here is a brief, brief introduction about the system. It's for UFS S2S models. And at, per, at the first part is FV3 DICO and GFS physics or GFD metaphysics, CCPP physical drivers. So we run all the, the, the data I'm going to show is run C384, 64 levels. Ocean is basically GFDS color degree setting. Everything for the GFDS on four setting. The way we have way more the, a half degree, but I'm not going to touch that. For the ice part, is for the autonomous model, and ice model doesn't come with its own grid. So ice model follow whatever ocean is. So basically, ice model is a color degree. Everything is the same grid as ocean. And for the driver, we use names, mediator, and the driver. And we are in the transition of replace names driver to CMF driver. Driver, but uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is from names driver. So this is our prototype runs. Uh, it part, it, we call it a P1 prototype one. Basically, it's like we start everything from scratch. So all the initial conditions are from CFSR. And we realize there are some issues in the ice initial condition. Also, for the ocean part, it's TS only. We do not have ocean currents. So for the, when after, after a couple of months, CBC generated an ocean DA based on MOM6, that gave us the full the star file of ocean. And uh, for the prototype 3.1, which is uh, I'm going to talk about that, we also have a CBC ice and analysis. We are, right now we're actively working on the prototype 4, which will include the ice and the wave part. But uh, I'm not going to touch that for all this. Runs there are totally 168 runs starting from April 2011 to March 2018, and all those cases are 35 days run. This seven years cover some strong enzo year, and some Larino year, also cover some thick ice or sh shallow ice year. Ocean validation is kind of challenging compared with that very part in that you have very comprehensive observation data and some mature enough EA so that you can define some metrics to do all this verification. But the ocean part, 
we, we do not have those kind of abundant uh, information. Uh, for, uh, so here I list all those uh, data sources that I'm going to use to, to uh, for the uh, surface height, we choose uh, a visual data. Next layer is it's Argo. So salinity, surface salinity is mass and the currents from Oscar and the 3D temperature was from UK Met Office EM4 and for the zonal currents in 3D, we choose the GODAS and it's, it's an internal ocean DA system. All this data, some come with daily, some come with printed, some are monthly mean. For, com for the fair comparison, every, every figures I'm going to show next will be based on January, April, July, and October monthly average. This is a surface currents. As I said, all things were very shiny because they are unevenly distributed compared with some atmospheric sand. If you see near equator area, see right at the equator, you see the equatorial counter currents, and just like two or three degree north, you see north equatorial currents, and like a three or four degree south, you see the south equatorial currents. All these three currents are sandwiched in a very narrow band. This makes the compression hard. On the left side are from US West January and April side, and the right side are from Oscar side, Oscar observation data. You can see you know, for the US West, it, 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 the simulation is uh, pretty good. You can see clearly the sandwich style, North Korean currents, South Korean currents, and Korean currents. And also, you can see the magnitude in, in quite a good shape. The next one is the uh, same thing for, the, for July and October. You can still see the stratification of those three currents. Overall, I have a feeling that all the data is kind of too smooth compared with the UFS, but uh, that's the best observation I can get. I do not have any other choice. Next one is the Gulf Stream. In our previous CFS V2, we use half degree for the ocean. So overall, the Gulf Stream and the Cushier Stream are kind of weak. But here we, in the UFS S2S system, we use a, we adopt a GFDS quarter degree setting. So you can see all those, the magnitude and the stretch of the Gulf Stream are pretty close to the observations. This is the January April one, and next is the July and the October one. Then here comes the cruise shield. Again, you can see the, the pattern, the stretch out, uh, close enough to the cruise shield, uh, to the Oscar data. That's uh, July and uh, October case. If you, see, uh, if you see October case, you can see you can see the, see the UFS is slightly weaker than the Oscar. The next come the equatorial undercurrents. This is January and April case. So you can see around like 100 meter dips, there's a strong ocean undercurrents. Compared left side the UFS, right side Goras. Compared with the Goras Ocean here, you can see for January and April, you can see the, the seasonality of the Trends of uh, these undercurrents uh, in the April case. And next one is come in July and October. You can see in October case, it, uh, these undercurrents start to weaken. Now, here is uh, the summer climb tem temperature at the equator. In, again, you do not, from here, you do not see the large spots that contain some. Really large drop bias. What do you see? Is it like say in April case, you can see in the eastern tropical Pacific, you can see about like 150 meter dips. There is about like one and a half degree warm. But overall, we do not see large spot with with some really large bias. I mean, in this system is uh, aimed for. Replace a kind of unsettled CFS V2 operation system. I mean, I was uh, heavily involved in the C development of CFS V2 from beginning to the end. I did a similar comparison for this kind of work, I mean, probably 10 years ago. Although I can see this figure is much better than 
let's see after V2. Then come with the surface salinity. Here is the, the uh, surface salinity minus smart smart is a satellite based shaved again. You can see near the coast all this red color, which means the UFS is too salty, but that's not totally true. If you see the next one, I use a smart minus WO18. You can see near the coast area, all those color have totally changed. This is, in other words, if we combine the list, list, uh, list part with the previous one, they are canceled. The reason is for the CFS, for, the, for this motion, the ocean DA initial condition, they start from GFDR's quarter degree setting, they spin up with the one motion of WOA. That's why you see the you see the smart man of WOA is always a negative value. So in other words, the salinity in the UFS is pretty good. The, the, the color, the bias you see is because the difference between the satellite retrieve the SMOPs and the WOA 18. Now come with a mixed layer dips. The, the validation ocean is, is kind of tricky because some variables are, like, are defined in different ways. Here comes the mixed layer dips. In the MOM6, it has a two variables reflected mixed layer dips. One is called MLD003, which they define the delta rule equal 0 0.03. And another one is the mixed layer dips 0125, which is uh, another criteria for delta rule. Why in the Argo is defining another way. I searched for the Argo documentation. I did not find the related information on what exact data route is used. So the next slide we can only compare qualitatively instead of quantitatively. You see the left one, UFS January and April side, and right one is Argo side. You can see in the winter, the dips of the mixed layer dips, which are used where it represents in the UFS compared with the observed data. Then next is the July and October case. You can see in the southern hemisphere, it makes it deep in the other and this is represented enough in the UFS. Then again, then come the, the sea surface height. Again, sea surface height has Slightly uh, different in the definition compared uh, when you compare uh, a visual data and the UFS in the MOM6. So, with, again, you need to just compare them qualitatively instead of quantitatively. If you see the uh, visual data, you can see just like about 20 degree north or south equator, it has two, two peak values in the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And then you can see a similar structure in the MOM6 is you can see like just about like a 25 degree north or south, you can see this peak value here. And this is for July and October case. It is, it is similar. You see the two peak Pacific and Atlantic. And you show the same thing at the MOM6. As I mentioned, they are in different definitions. So the, magnitude is slightly different, although here I use the exact same color bar. So overall, uh, the UFS is being developed and, and all sorts of different testing, joint efforts for EMC, ESI, NCA, NEST, and the GFDR. And uh, from my talk, you can see that all major ocean features are really planted in the you have perhaps 3.1 runs. This includes surface currents such as pressure, Gulf Stream, and stratification of zonal currents near the equator, the north external currents, south external currents, external currents. So the seasons height, the salinity, and the mixed layer dips are well represented in the simulation. And now for the 3D features, okay, we see the pretty good shape in the thermal plan and the equatorial undercurrents. Yeah. Yeah, this is yeah, um, 
not going to go to back up. I just wait for some questions in case. Hello. Any question? Yeah. So um, there are there's kind of some vague questions. It's more of a discussion that is in the. Um, uh, Slack channel. Ben Cash says if you have run the C3072 um, global atmosphere, it looked like a few groups um, had in various presentations. I would love to chat about how you set that up. Nameless settings, um, PE layout, files needed, etc. Thanks. To which um, I mean, go hard also um, said that he had some additional questions. So um, I, I'm guessing that. Um, Rather than having a full discussion here, maybe we, we can point you to the Slack channel where you can um, pick up the discussion there. Is that okay. what you prefer, Stacey? Um, it depends, but um, I don't see any um, questions. Yeah, one, one yeah there, there, in my talk, I did not mention one of the most important variable, SST here, because the, my colleague uh, Lydia Stefanova, she's heavily involved in verification of the whole copper system, and the SST is one of the key variables she's looking at. So that's why I skipped that variable. Okay. Well, so I'll encourage you to, to go over to the Slack channel and, and pick up the conversation with Ben and, and um, Iman. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess that concludes it. <clears throat> it's 347. We have a few more minutes. Um, but I believe that will be it for now. Thanks, everybody. I guess we'll get started on the, um, the last but not the least uh session uh of the workshop on regional configurations and extremes uh development applications we have five really good talks lined up here um i am jeff beck from noaa gsl dtc so i'll be the chair uh jamie wolf uh from and uh ncar uh, dtc will be the moderator just a couple announcements before we get started uh, each presenter will have 15 minutes uh including two to three minutes of questions so i'll um give you um, a notice when you get to about 12 to 13 minutes that there are two or three minutes remaining. And then for any questions, please go ahead and post those in the regional configurations and extremes uh, Slack channel. Jamie's already put a, a message up there um, inviting people to include questions there and she will relay them uh, time permitting at the end of each presentation. So go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And it looks like we're ready to go with Jacob's presentation, which is titled uh, A Limited Area Modeling Capability for the Finite Volume Cube Sphere Dynamical Core. All right, thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So sometimes there's a little bit of lag here between when I try to advance the slide and when the slide actually advances. So that might take a couple seconds. There we go. OK, so let's start with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so some of this is going to be familiar for those of you who saw a presentation I gave kind of on the UF, uh, UFS uh, short range weather app overview on Monday morning session. Um, so uh, we'll just start with the, you know, the fact that uh, when FE3 was originally um, selected as a part of the NGGPS project, uh, it was a global model that had a nesting capability, but it did not have a standalone or limited area model capability uh, with it at that time. And that's something that we really need uh, for is an option for convection allowing model uh, type applications. And I'll make a couple cases here uh, just to try to uh, you know, make that point clear. Uh, one, the first one's pretty obvious. Um, you know, it avoids extra resources that are required to run a global parent. So you're not having to integrate an entire global model uh, for the purposes of providing lateral boundary conditions or any sorts of two-way feedbacks associated with that uh, nested or uh, nested comparatively high resolution domain. And the second is a little bit <clears throat> perhaps less obvious, and it's one that's really most related to operational NWP applications. And as somebody who's 
uh, at, at the Environmental Modeling Center. This is also uh, pretty important to us. Um, and that's uh, under the context of rapidly updated data simulation. It's uh, just much more feasible in a limited area model when you're applying it uh, to a high resolution framework. And I'll give that an example here. Uh, so if you take a couple, two operational models that are fairly popular, one is the GFS, which I hope everybody attending uh, knows, uh, and the other is uh, the HER. Uh, say for 12Z GFS, that model actually starts running at about 1445Z, whereas the HER in comparison runs much earlier. Uh, around 1223Z, it starts to gather its data and start its data simulation and observation processing uh, process and so on. So if you were to nest a high resolution model into the GFS, you'd have to wait for that output uh, much later than what you would otherwise would if you had a limited area version and you ran it much earlier. On the other hand, uh, if you tried to run a global model much earlier, then you may not get as much op uh, observational input uh, to it. So there are a lot of trade-offs um, uh, associated with that kind of configuration. So uh, for relatively short-term forecasts, it's very convenient to run with a limited area configuration and also allows us to uh, perhaps run at higher resolution as well due to the computational savings and so on. Okay, so there's obviously a potential drawback here. Uh, one is that the boundary data from an external forecast really can't be as accurate as those provided by a parent to a nest every time step during the integration. We also miss nice things like two-way feedback. Um, fortunately, with under the uh, UFS framework and the FV3 here, uh, we have a global with a nest capability and now we have a limited area capability. So we can actually quantify uh, the impact of this kind of configuration. And I'll explain more of that uh, later on in the slides. So first, let's talk a little bit about constructing the lateral boundary conditions. Uh, what I have on the right here, it's a little bit of a complex figure, <clears throat> and uh, some of the proportions on here are a little bit ex exaggerated, and they're really just to prove or sort of demonstrate, um, excuse me, the kind of computations and information uh, that are stored in the halo regions or the lateral boundary areas surrounding the integration domain. So I'll point here with my cursor, and what you actually have here is the model integration domain. Uh, obviously, it's, this is not the scale, um, so you know this is where your forecast is occurring uh, and, and whatnot, and on that side here is where you have uh, the construction of the actual lateral boundaries themselves. Notice that you have uh, about three to four rows of data outside the integration domain, and this is just uh, there to accommodate, accommodate um, uh, the horizontal derivatives that the model needs to execute. Uh, as an example of what's going on in this particular uh, setup here, we have a procedure that runs before the actual model does to generate and prepare and prepackage the uh, lateral boundary conditions. We use this, we do this through a utility called change res. Uh, those of you who have started uh, looking at some of the UFS framework are probably getting a little bit familiar with that. It'll be bundled with the UFS short range weather app, of course, as well later on this, this fall. Um, so that uh, generates the boundary conditions files. They're read in and they're remapped and specified um, in a way that's consistent with the model's internal uh, infrastructure. Okay, so once we have all that set up, I want to note that in this particular application, there's no special treatment to how the lateral boundaries are applied on the edge of this of the integration domain. They're simply specified and we let the model run. So there's no blending or relaxation zone or anything like that. So uh, here's just an example of a, of a 84 hour forecast on a three kilometer grid using bound, lateral boundary uh, and initial conditions from the GFS. This is uh, from April, mid-April 2018. It's a zero Z run, goes out 84 hours. Um, so we're pretty zoomed out here. You know, it's, it's hard to see details and stuff kind of come emanating in and off the boundaries. But really what I, the entire point of this particular loop is just to show or demonstrate that the model, um, you know, integrates all the way through. Things look generally correct. We see synoptic features that are meteorologically relevant. Um, just sort of a bulk, uh, you know, 10,000 foot view kind of perspective just to make sure that the things are, are working uh, correctly. Okay, so the next step in this procedure now is to say, okay, well, now we have this limited area configuration and we we're also able to run with the nested configuration. Let's see, uh, you know, what the differences are in the resulting forecast if we compare the two. So uh, in order to do this, we set up a limited area configuration that covers the area you see there on the right in this pink box, this pink outline here is the computational domain. Um, and we configured a nest config, uh, uh, run uh, with the global model um, exactly the same. In fact, it's, it covers the same area uh, of the pink domain here as well. And you can actually see the associated, the global grid that's associated with it with the 
uh, stretch factor of, of 1.5, that kind of refinement factor that's applied to the global um, as well to kind of get that uh, somewhat uh, a refinement over uh, the, the, the CONUS domain there uh, using a Schmidt transformation. And then there's also um, uh, refine, an additional refinement that's applied when we generate the nest by a factor of three. So we go from nine kilometers with the local uh, refinement and then a refinement ratio of three to get us down to three kilometers for the nest in a limited area model grid that's centered there over CONUS. So um, the neat thing about this is that the way in which a user specifies the limited area configuration, it's conceptually analogous. It's effectively identical to how you would do it with a nest domain as well. So it makes kind of setting things up for this comparison somewhat more straightforward. Uh, we're using the same physics uh, for each with the exception that the global model is running with a parameterized convection, though it's not running with parameterized convection in the nest. Um, the other, so really the only difference here um, is that, uh, you know, the difference in the lateral boundary conditions uh, source, uh, the limited areas coming from the GFS is the three hour boundary updates, uh, somewhat temporally coarse there. We probably want to use to something a little bit finer uh, resolution temporally going forward uh, versus the nest, which gets its boundaries updated every parent time step, as well as it has a two way feedback capability. So let's look at some forecast results and we'll start with uh, an assessment of the computational performance. So those are uh, one of the attractive uh, components of trying to move to a limited area configurations so that we can actually save a lot of compute time. Uh, so here we're comparing uh, the limited area in the nest to three kilometers over the domain I had just shown. What we have here are 24-hour forecast uh, clock times. <clears throat> so it's wall time on the y-axis, and it's the total time required to execute a 24-hour forecast. We turned off all history uh, file writes just to try to eliminate the impact that I.O. might have on uh, testing performance. So everything that you see here is run um, with 20 MPI tasks each and two threads uh, uh, per task for MPI task on, on, on a node. So a couple things I wanna note here is that the limited area model completes in about half the time the nest for a given number of tasks. So if you see a total number of tasks here and we hold them to be uh, identical, we see a pretty big difference in the total time required to, to, to complete with its uh, the limited area taking about half the time. In addition, if you wanna have the same execution time between the two systems, it requires uh, far fewer tasks uh, for the limited area configuration than what it does for the, for the global configuration if you want to run the same amount of time. So um, it's considerably more efficient, uh, and I think it's, it's pretty obvious as to why this is not a surprising result, since there's really no need to integrate a global model or handle a two-way feedback. And then there's another little bit in there that the, eliminates the parent's generation of the nest lateral boundary conditions every time step, which there's gonna be a little bit of overhead for that. So moving along, we'll compare the forecast output. So we have about a month of cases that we've looked at on um, the spring of 2019. These are, uh, all the initializations were done uh, daily at zero Z. Um, we did our forecast out to 60 hours. So about the time range uh, that's equivalent actually to what we do in operations for our convection allowing configuration. So the longest forecast we have in, option, in, in operations at three kilometers is from the NAM CONUS nest and that goes out to 60 hours. So it's on par with that. Uh, we're looking here at, uh, we'll be looking at precip and upper air stats. We'll have a couple slides here. We'll start with the precip stats. Um, the performance diagram may be familiar for those who saw my talk on Monday morning. Um, and again, just showing here, uh, you know, the best forecast here on the performance diagram is in the upper right, and the worst forecast here is in the lower left. The differences between a limited area configuration in red and the nest configuration in blue, relatively small, some degradation in the limited area configuration, although overall, um, they're quite similar. And so this was done uh, using 24-hour accumulation intervals uh, using CCPA. Um, so overall, quite similar. All right, next item. Uh, one thing we really like to look at, um, this is a feature in MET Plus, uh, which is, is fantastic to use and really helps us um, in doing a lot of model validation and, uh, and verification work and helpful with development, is the generation of scorecards. Um, and so here we reuse a scorecard to do comparisons uh, between the LAM and the nest configuration uh, out to the full 60 hours of the forecast. We have bias plotted and bias corrected root mean square error. These are upper air plots. So, um, you know, we have a, just a handful of boxes here, you know, looking at 250 hectopascals, 500, 850, and so on for geopotential heights, temperature, and specific humidity. Um, what you'll note here is that we have a negative bias that becomes statistically significant that starts to really creep in 
um, by forecast hour 24 in the limited area model when comparing with the nest. And it seems to grow uh, in, in magnitude in terms of the degree of a negative bias as you get to forecast hour 60. Bias corrected RMSCs, um, generally, you know, there are differences, of course, but they're not statistically significant uh, uh, until we get to about forecast hour uh, 48 or so in geopotential height. So we see this uh, bias that starts to creep in by forecast hour 24, and I think that's something that we really want to uh, highlight and, and think about going forward in the following slide, just to kind of keep in mind, to try to address that by the end. So uh, those are some of the forecast results. Uh, I've got a little bit of time left here, so I want to talk about some of the improvements to lateral boundary condition treatments. At the early part of the talk, I mentioned that there's no special treatment that's applied on the edges. We just sort of specify the boundaries at the edges, and then the model uh, just handles the integration. Uh, so there's no smoothing or anything like that. So if you take a look and you zoom in, you look at, say, something like uh, the winds um, very high up in the model atmosphere, you'll see uh, that you can get uh, these little these waves, these two delta X waves that come off the boundary. Um, so these waves dissipate at about 40 kilometers into the domain. Into the domain. This is at about 267 uh, Pascal, so pretty high up, model layer four, um, and it's about one meter per second. So uh, we did a little bit of additional development to try to address this, and we looked into the use of a blending function. This is the shape of that blending function. It kind of has an exponential uh, 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 drop off here. And what this does is it really mixes the lateral boundary, the values coming from the lateral boundary condition file. And actually, we have new lateral boundary conditions now that reach out all the way into the model grid. And it kind of mixes the, 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 the values coming from the lateral boundary uh, specification with those in the model integration domain. Um, and it, and the uh, weighting for that mixing is specified uh, by this uh, exponential blending function. Uh, so it's a fairly simple procedure, felt it's fairly straightforward, and the impact that it has is, is uh, pretty noticeable. So I'll try to flip between these two slides, and you'll note that these sort of two delta X waves uh, vanish when we switch to uh, using this blending function. So this is actually what we're using now in our real-time parallels. The other final thing I wanna note uh, with the limited area model capability is that it also requires, when you're running a limited area system uh, and you're running with the data assimilation schemes, so you're doing a hybrid EN VAR type analysis, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're depending on a lot of our boundary conditions coming from some uh, probably global system. And sometimes it's the prior cycles global model. So say you're running a 12Z analysis, you might be using lateral boundary conditions from the 6C GFS. So after you run your analysis, the analysis state may not be entirely consistent with the lateral boundary conditions that were supplied from that external model, your 6C GFS. So what we need to do is we need to update the lateral boundary conditions. So we've developed a utility that uh, basically adds the lateral boundary files along the edges around the perimeter of the limited area domain such that when the fields are fed to the data simulation system, uh, the lateral boundaries are updated automatically and we can just take peel those uh, fields off around the perimeter and update the lateral boundary files and then run the integration. So the impact of this you can see in these two graphics here. On the left is without that lateral boundary update following data simulation, you can see this kink in the 500 millibar height field that's um, uh, model noise and actually zips through the domain rather quickly in a very unpleasant fashion. And on the right uh, is with the uh, lateral boundary update following the data simulation uh, step. So, and these are just short two hour forecasts uh, following initialization. So this is also another uh, piece that we've, we've developed as a part of the limited area model capability. So <clears throat> um, in closing, the LAMS more efficient, which is not surprising. We do see some degradation at times greater than forecast hour 24, the negative bias creeping in. We think some of this has to do with the fact that um, our lateral boundary upgrade frequency for that particular test was relatively coarse at a three hour interval. I think if we, we reduced it to a, a much finer update frequency or something that was maybe on the order of an hour, that'd probably help quite a bit. It's also important to note that with the limited area capability, we're missing some of those nice aspects that the Nest has in terms of two-way feedback. So we're sure that you know, those aspects are, are playing a bit of a role. Um, and we could repeat those tests or look at the impacts of, uh, of, of lateral boundary blending as well. So the limited area capability will, part of, will be part of the UFS short range weather app release uh, in November. Um, so look forward to having it there and it will support multiple sources for initial and lateral boundary conditions. And I've noted those there as well. Um, and finally, I wanna thank all our collaborators across NOAA and universities um, and CAR DTC who provided a lot of valuable feedback during development. Thank you very right, much. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Great presentation. Um, 
we have time for one question probably. All right, there are a couple questions. So I'll, I'll read off the first one from YJ Kim. Uh, the question is, what, would it be possible to start running her in LAM mode and starting using the boundary conditions from the real-time GFS when available in nested mode? If I understand that question correctly, and we can, I can clarify in Slack if I don't, um, we are actually running a real-time parallel. It's not quite in her mode, but it does have hourly updates. It's very um, green, so to speak. So it's, it's pretty early days, but it does feature hourly updates. Um, and so we are doing that right now. Now, we don't have a GFS that has a nest capability running um, at the moment. I think that's, that's currently not part of our plans in terms of the production suite. Um, but the test here did include comparing the LAM and the NEST capability. Um, maybe I'm not quite understanding the question completely, but we, I'm certainly happy to follow up in Slack. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. And I'll just add that we have our own HER-like version, uh, GSL, that's also running in real time at 12 and 0Z. Absolutely. Thanks, number Jeff. Of flavors, number of flavors of that. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. There's one more question from Lisa Bankson. So um, okay. we can head over there and... Read that. Um, we'll move on to Jim Purser. We'll be giving a presentation on the extended Schmidt uh, mnemonic grid for regional applications. Jim, we'll hand things off to you. Hello. Uh, how do I get started here? So, do you have an invitation to share your screen? I don't see it. Okay, I can go ahead and. Oh. Now I think there an invitation went out. So if you see it, you can go ahead and share. Looks like we're viewing your screen, Jim. You just need to put your presentation in. Okay. Or your so, can you see my screen? Yes. My presentation. I'll uh, let me just go ahead so and maximize that. that and can you see it now? It should be oh, maximized. It might be a delay. On my screen, it's maximized. You're in presentation mode? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe not. Hang on. Sorry about this. I'm. I've got my uh, full screen here. It's gone on to the next slide for me. Can you see? Ah, now it's maximized. All right. There must be a okay, delay. So, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So um, my collaborators are Dushan, Jovic, and. Gerard Katakin, Tom Black, who re recently retired, Jeff Beck, Julie Dong, and Jacob Carley. And uh, the context is that we have, we were given this FP3 global model, which uses the cubic geometry. And um, what we want to do, as much as possible, is to get a regional model that uses the same kind of map transformation. So, um, Gerard and Tom came to me and asked for some help in order to get the mapping parameters of the uh, cubic grid uh, selected so that we could go, do good uh, regional models for, for rectangular, large re rectangular domains. So they were having trouble at the time with uh, excessively high resolution around the edges and corners of the domains. Now, there are two available parameters in the global cubic uh, FV3 model, which um, many of the available menu options could be thought of as being members of that two parameter set. So one parameter is, is available to control the profile of spacing between the grid lines on of the two families of the grid. So uh, the two extremes were the, the equidistant and the equiangular grids. Uh, I'm having trouble advancing my frame. I don't know what's going on here. 
So on the left, you see the equidistant spacing. What that means is it's equidistant on the centrally or mnemonically projected uh, tangent plane. And on the right is the sort of opposite extreme, or what was thought of as the opposite extreme, which is the equiangular spacing of the grids. Uh, we can think of those as being the uh, being uh, parameterized by a parameter b, and you can think of the geometrical interpretation of that. If you have an arc line angular distance uh, square root, square root of b arc cos of square root of b from the face center, then the transverse grid lines which intersect it do so at a uniform spacing on, on the sphere. So the b equals zero case is actually obtained as a as a limiting case. And that's the equiangular case that you see on the right. With this purely geometrical definition of the spacing parameter b in the range zero to one, we can find the all of the FE three GFS grids that we use operationally. The the operational one being the the case where the grid is uniform along the edge of the cube that corresponds to b equals a half. But algebraically, there is actually no obstacle to analytically continuing the parameter b into the extended additional ranges where b is either less than zero or b is greater than one. And so on the two cartoons below, you see on the left, b equals minus a half that uh, crushes the grid lines together at the edges. On the other extreme, you have b equals plus five, which sort of uh, squeezes grid lines together at the center. So the comment I made to the right here is, although these extreme grids are not viable choices for the global grid, you wouldn't ever use those, I think. They do show that a greater parameter range is available when we go ahead and construct a limited area grid involving the same sort of parameter space. That's just one of the parameters. Now the FV3 cube is also equipped with the second parameter. This is a Schmidt conformal refinement factor S, and it works as follows. You take the mnemonic grid that has already been formed with your parameter B, straight lines on the tangent plane, which means great circles on the sphere. And this is a geometrical interpretation. A point X on the sphere projects centrally onto a tangent plane to X sub G in the blue. Or you could have a stereographic projection where you have a, the point X projecting through the point at the south pole, the opposite pole, onto the equatorial plane, to the point X sub S. And this is the definition of the stereographic projection, which is standard. And um, if you do the stereographic projection from a, a unit sphere in such a way that um, on the equatorial plane, you then scale it by a factor of one over S and then back project stereographically onto the same sphere. So you're shrinking the equatorial plane. Then you get a, a conformally distorted image of the original mnemonic grid. If S is bigger than one, you get high, higher resolution in the area of the North Pole in this case. But an equivalent picture is that the sphere on which the original mnemonic grid is constructed is of radius one over S, and its stereographic projection onto the equatorial plane is then not scaled before it's that projection onto the unit radius Earth. So the question is, what if we replace the parameter s by another parameter k given by uh, s squared? So when 1 over s is the spherical radius, k equals s squared becomes the Gaussian curvature. But there's now no obstacle in principle to allowing k to be a negative value. You think, now what, what does it mean to have a, a, a sphere with a, an imaginary radius? Well, for a negative curvature K, the original sphere is actually a pseudosphere or hyperbolic plane. And it's fairly well known in geometry that you can have a, ge a mnemonic grid on the hyperbolic plane. Um, if you're familiar with the, the pictures of uh, Moritz Escher, the circle limit pictures, uh, most of those represent the what's called a Poincare representation of the hyperbolic plane. And that's like the stereographic representation. But there are also alternative pictures of the hyperbolic plane where the, um, the geodesics are straight lines and that corresponds to the mnemonic projection. So you can actually define a mnemonic grid 
in the hyperbolic plane and the, the geometrical construction, or at least one of the geometrical constructions for this is shown in the right panel uh, where you can see the correspondence between all the elements on the, the standard stereographic and mnemonic projections on the left, which I showed before, and their corresponding pictures on the right show how you can use a double hyper hyperboloid to do the projections instead of, of a sphere. And you get exactly analogous um, constructions. But now you can go into the K negative domain and you can get a projection through the extended Schmidt transformation where you have a mnemonic grid that projects onto the real sphere from its original construction on the hyperbolic pseudosphere. So this is a way of further extending the parameter space. And so um, we have conformal mappings of the sphere to its, itself to enhance the resolution of a global model locally. These were proposed by Frank Schmidt in a paper in, by Trigger, 1977, I believe. But when the sphere is represented by some standard stereographic projection to the complex plane, then these continuous transformations are known as Mervius transformations, or bilinear complex bilinear transformations. Uh, but if we replace the parameter S by the parameter K equal to S squared, the traditional Schmidt mappings are retained for the K, I should, this is meant to be the, uh, for the K positive range, but an extended range of the parameter space for K negative is now opened up, which while not valid for the whole globe, is certainly valid for the mnemonic grids with their line spacing parameter B applied to limited areas. And there's one last thing I need to do in order to regularize the otherwise singular behavior of the mapping transformations near the special stereographic case, which we recover in the K equals zero case, we really need to rescale the original line spacing parameter B, which we do simply by replacing it by the new parameter A that replaces B, A is equal to K times B. That's our final parameter pair defining the limited area extended Schmidt mnemonic grid uses the parameter pair AK. So the next part of the process is how do we choose the best map parameters for a given rectangular region? In order to apply the, the mapping in an optimal way for a limited domain, we want to define an optimality criterion. And uh, Gerard uh, did quite a lot of work on this himself in a, and uh, in the early stages of this work, he uh, produced some of the nice pictures um, showing the, the resolution uh, function over the domains. And I'll show that one of these in a minute. The Jacobian matrix of the mapping to a point related to the change of the Earth-centered Cartesian three-vector X with respect to the changes of the components of the maps two-vector is defined by the first expression I have here, this Jacobian J. And you can define from that an associated symmetric two by two gram matrix, J transpose times J. And the objective should be to minimize something which relates to a kind of variance of G, since this can serve as an objective measure of the map's overall inhomogeneity. So quantifying the inhomogeneity of the map, um, there are really two elements of this. The departure of the gram matrix from each point from a, a constant multiple of the identity gives you a measure of the local deformation or anisotropy. That's obviously something that we'd like to minimize. We don't want our, our grid elements to be long, thin, stretched rectangles if we can help it. So that's something we want to penalize. Uh, there's also another important diagnostic which we consider, uh, and that is the, uh, the variability of the aerial resolution of the map itself. And if we construct the, um, the related matrix, the two by two matrix given by the matrix logarithm or half the matrix logarithm of G, we can use this as a basis for a diagnostic of inhomogeneity, which itself is parameterized by a gamma um, parameter. And the top expression shows how you get an, an aerial average. So the A here is not the map, mapping parameter, it's the area of the map in terms of the um, integration over the grid space. So it's just the, the area in map units. 
so the the effect of the parameter gamma here if gamma is small then you're treating the um, the components of of mat deformation more or less equally that's where the the q factor comes from the, the q diagnostic if gamma is allowed to become large uh, up to just below one then you put much more emphasis on the aerial in homogeneity because it picks out the trace of the logarithm and that if you remember that the uh, the um, logarithm of the matrix the uh, logarithm of the determinant is uh, effectively giving you the area in homogeneity so what we typically use is a, a value of gamma equal to 0.8 the grid parameter optimization minimizes this Q with respect to the parameters A and K that we uh, discussed earlier. And we, this is an example of the result we get with the extended Schmidt harmonic grid on the, on the left. This uh, particular figure was provided by Shan Hu Jian, and I believe that probably uses the uh, software that uh, Gerard produced. Three minutes. On the right, uh, the ordinary uh, mnemonic grid. Do I have two minutes? Yeah. Yes, that's uh, right. Okay, thanks. So you can see with the ordinary mnemonic grid, you get a fairly large disparity of the grid resolution, which is what we were trying to cure with this new grid. And I think we succeeded quite well. And uh, here's a slide I borrowed from uh, Jeannie Dong's presentation earlier during this meeting showing the advantages of using this in the case of the hurricane, the HAFS hurricane analysis and forecast system, where um, we can get a, a reduction of the wind error, which is shown here on the uh, first two of the upper slides, and uh, a reduction of the wind bias. And uh, the, the HAFS ESG grid shows a smaller intensity error, better intensity skill, and reduced negative wind bias and the track forecasts tend to be closer to each other in the in the, <clears throat> this um, composite the ESG improves on the intensity of the forecast and reduces the negative wind bias so there are clearly advantages of using this grid it's, at least it's, that's how it seems so finally the ESG grid allows a rectangular allows rectangular domains of very large geographical dimensions. Generally, we find that we need that to use that negative K, which implies a slight flaring of, e of each uh, grid axis edges compared to the ordinary family of mnemonic grids. And you can see that by looking down on the corner, you see the corner is a, an acute angle for the ESG grid, whereas it would have been a map obtuse angle for an ordinary mnemonic grid. And the uh, A parameter, tends to be of either sign, and that depends on the domain shape and size. So I think that my conclusion is that we find a way to extend the existing space of the two parameters of the FV3 cube sphere, Schmidt mnemonic grids, by a form of analytic continuation, so that the old parameter domain remains a subset of the new extended one. So in some sense, we're not really doing anything new, we're just recognizing that the existing parameter space of the, the cube is a subset domain of a larger parameter space that was there all the time. And um, so the conclusion is that with allowing negative K allows a surprisingly homogeneous resolution in very large grids on, in rectangular regions. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, we have time for a question. I don't know if there are any in Slack. I see one from Bin Lu. Jamie? So the question from Bin Lu is, is it a limit on how large the domain can be? Yes, the limit tends to be um, roughly, uh, I think it's about 180 or 190 degrees across. So it, it, uh, that's to, from the edge midpoints of the rectangle. So it's actually very large from the center of the grid to the edge. In other words, it can be greater than 90 degrees, much larger than one face of the cube. Thank you, Jim. 
I just want to add, it's been a fantastic innovation for the FE3 LAM, and it's made the grid extremely homogenous, which is fantastic. So, thank you. Uh, thank I have you. a lot of help from my collaborators. Sure. Yes. Thank. Uh, we can thank them too. Um, okay. Go ahead and move to the next presentation by Xu Jin Zhang, uh, who will be presenting on the moving nest implementation for the hurricane analysis and forecasting system in the Unified Forecast System Framework. Xu Jin? Yes, can you see my screen yet? Yes, looks good. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is the, um, this is certainly the teamwork. We have a um, whole team here, uh, include the EMC and the GFDL. Um, this effort with, um, supported by um, Hurricane Supplemental. Um, this is our uh, half scientific objective. Um, half is a um, UFS application that's to provide the inner in core analysis and the global regional forecast guidance um, of TC track intensity structure and, uh, um, and ambient, ambient uh, flow to operational community. Secondly, is the extend the forecast guidance up to seven days to address the uh, weather ready nation priority. Third is the uh, target on the scientific and, uh, and foreca forecast prior priority and the guidance of the um, hurricane forecast improvement program and uh, UFS strate uh, strategic implementation plan. Um, that includes Im improving the guidance on track and intensity, rapid intensity uh, rapid intensity change, um, stone, set, stone size and structure, genesis, rainfall, uh, tornado potential guidance, really uh, associate TC, and uh, also facilitate the liability downstream application and forecast, such as uh, um, stone surge, inland flooding, um, and et cetera, and force the innovation and uh, application of the observing and uh, um, simulation technologies. Um, our uh, before before we start our development, we want to see what's the capability in the model there. So we look at the dynamics and the numerics. Um, is, this is the um, full compressible vector invariant uh, urine equation and a fully non hydrostatic with uh, semi implement solver, uh, Lagrangian dynamics, um, quasi orthogonal and quasi uniform cube sphere grid and a finite volume dynamic core for um, massive parallelization, and there's also simultaneous integration for nesting. So this is the dynamic core uh, it's, um, itself. So we, we want to take advantage of this. And also the other um, capability there, the CCPP framework, ESMF-based uh, ESMF, uh, coupling design, JADA, um, JADA DA, um, a JADA adaptable DA approach. And then also we have um, operational and research interchangeable workflow and the common products for research and the forecast. So this is the current, uh, current available capability we can start with. So uh, another one is when we, uh, when we start our development, we look at our problem. So TC is the global phenomenon. So um, in order to forecast the um, forecast for TC, we want, we basically, we need a global, mo global model to do that, to, to, uh, cap to capable resolve the, uh, resolving the um, convective, convective scale. So that is um, current, this, this is the 20, 21 years um, climatology. We can see different basin all has um, uh, TC there. So that's that's one of the problems we keep in mind when we develop the um, halves. It's a it's a global phenomenon. We want applying to uh, global forecast, and and also we have the some limitation is the computer resource. So right now the um the up the up part the bottom part we have um, faster and faster um, chips, but the, there's limit there right now. Um, we almost hit the limit because it's it's reach, reach like a five nano um, meter nanometer um, scale. So the chip has the limit. Another one is the, uh, on the top. 
we have plenty of space can improve. So this application is focused on the software um, design and the um, algorithm design. So this this is the uh, two new um, area we are working on that. And if if you if you look at the detail a little bit, the um, the software can can actually um, improve a lot of the performance. If you look at it, um, at this moment we use advanced language, so certainly already improve a lot of the uh, efficiency of the code. But uh, meantime, when we use all this yellow box, the te technology, it, these are basic based based on the um, algorithm and the um, pal um, pal uh, parallelization. So we can improve about five uh, five hundred times of the code um, efficiency. So, so the last part certainly is depend on the chip design. So that that part is the vendor will give us the advantage. So this is the um, one of the reason we design such kind of approach. So the um, half development is driven by the operational needs and scientific scientific advancement and in um, innovation technology, uh, innovative um, technology. So for this TC problem, we want um first we try the um the moving nest because dc is even though it's a global phenomenon but it's not a cover all the um, all area so we want have enough resolution to resolve the tc area meantime <clears throat> we want we want um the model have uh, sufficient sufficient efficiency to move uh, to um, to do the uh, forecast within the requirement uh, required uh, um, time frame. Um, secondly, is the when we design the um, algorithm, it, we need to consider the dynamic core, and that is um, I already summarized in the previous slide. Uh, that is um, fully adaptive to the modern technology, which which means that. Um, it can be parallel, parallelization a lot of the um, to to the modern technology, and the third third thing is the we we take advantage of the um, UFS R two and O two R constant iteration. So this, we develop hops from operation uh, operational UFS. Um, then we have uh, research to operation and operation to research seamless transition. Which means we work with operational focus, and um, in the operational machine, our our similar operational machine, then we directly apply our um, development in um, into the operational model. Then also the development and the implementation constantly. So whichever the uh, the technology mature, we start to implement and do the real time um, forecast uh, test uh, experiment. So. Um, here is the uh, um, current, current um, progress of the moving as de development and the implementation. So, um, in the in the le left side, we we have the load map. What what we want to do in um, in this development, and the right side we see we see the the code in uh, in the um, in in the GFS code in the in uh, UFS code, so so when we look when we look right now the the green part we already uh, complete, and the um the orange part we still ongoing and the um the blue part we haven't um started yet, so started yet so so that's the those um each i each item we are we are going and we are working on that and some is we plan to work on that. So this, I, I give you a little bit of detail of this, um, the moving nest uh, algorithm and the code inventory. So moving nest, moving nest infrastructure code, the moving and uh, the memory shift routine, interpretation routine, and offline test driver. This is already developed. The function and uh, the, the each each one is uh, um, the, the data shift is after nest moving. Then the ha uh, the hello refueling. And the interpretation of the uh, prognostic diagnostic variables, uh, CD, uh, C, C grade, D grade staggering, and IO data for diagnostics and the coupling. 
and also um, we we have the um, moving that moving nest code into DICO. That's still testing. We haven't completed that part yet. Um, the the right side you can see the um, the C, uh, this this is this is the D grid, and we have also this model also have C grid. So we have a pretty complicated grid uh, structure. So the code the code have to um, take care of all those uh, um, different grid structure. Okay, and then also another critical part is the moving the uh, the stone moving tracking. So when we when we develop our um, um, hurricane model, we always think about we we just cover enough bigger of the stone area. So that's that's what I, what what we are doing here. If you can see my um, mouse point point, and then you see this is the the nest domain. So the orange dom orange area that is the um, that that is the cover cover the um, inner core. So when 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 we do that, we decided we decided that uh, um, that area. Once we decided the area, we can start the searching. Make make sure this uh, the stone is if the stone moving, we move our nest. Okay, so that is the whole the code uh, the whole code try to do when um, all this all because this is called uh, the algorithm called very frequently. So we have to use this. Um, all this tech advantage, all this technology to um, to to uh, construct our code. So once we once we uh, complete this moving nest, then the, um, that code the, we are, we have the plan test plan for this. So the the code have to um, stable, also reproducible, and the, um, also the scale scalable. All this uh, requirement we test because the code use called very frequently we have to make the code really really fast so that the um so that the not slow down the model um and uh, what i said is that we develop certain capability we start to implement implement so this is one of the uh, example the multiple st static nest we develop that's the intermediate um uh, products because we're going to develop the um the moving nest we have to Develop a lot of capability within the uh, 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 right now. UFS not available, so we we implement uh, first. We implement the two static nest in the uh, in halves, and the, uh, we also um, test those bitwise identical results with baseline and halves, and we also successfully run 168 uh, forecast run. Um, second nest, second nest also. Uh, working so workflow and we add this capability into the workflow pre-processing and uh, um, right now we are on um, the, the road to uh, to do the HFIP real-time demo. So the um, this is the another another example we show the uh, moving nest and what the moving legs look look like. If when you move this nest, you will see that um, the data is shifting. So once we shift, then then we start the integration, uh, the model, and also we feel the uh, leading edge. So this is what uh, what we are doing for this uh, moving nest. Um, this is our uh, our um, you know, stepwise implementation. So the this one is the um, the regional limit limit area model. Um, that is, um, uh, Gilly and uh, and Jim already um, talked about that. That is the regional, and we have the global with Nest, and um, right now we have another one is the uh, global with two Nest cover um, Atlantic Basin and the East Pacific uh, Central Pacific Basin. So this this is all our um, real time demo uh, this year. So all the all the data will will be available in um, this website. When and when once you access this slide, you can click all this website. The um, the stone stone.lml.noaa.gov. There's there's all this model available, and uh, um, this is the EMC operational uh, website that include HWOF, HMOM, and HOPS B, and and 
the the regional model, I haven't seen the uh, and half A. So I haven't seen the half B, which is the global global nest version on that website yet. Um, but that's because our our is not the operational, so we are experimental. So they they probably not in that website. Also, we have the hrip.org that that website has the um, real time um, re real time model and uh, the experiment experiment model on that website to produce the um, products. So um, if you're interested in the real time run our uh, this season. So you can go to these three websites to uh, find out the result. Um, this is our um, roadmap. So, Two so okay, yeah. So this this is one of the uh, critical component is the uh, moving algorithm. Certainly, we uh, we also change the uh, FMS infrastructure. So this is all connected to the um, um, UFS uh, UFS uh, halves. So. Between HAFS and uh, UFS, we have seamless um, interaction. So also the G uh, GFS ensemble can get, provide us an input for um, nest DA and, uh, and the ocean model, ocean model through the this couple uh, this coupler can interact with uh, um, UFS HAFS uh, HAFS atmos atmospheric component. So this this is the whole system look like in the future. Um, with this, this is the summary slide. I, I don't want to write a lot of words there. That's the, give you a visual uh, look like the, the, the future model will look like. So if we have five stone in the, um, in the globally, all these stone we will track and then and, and, and have a nest put on that and the, and the nest will move, the, um, move with each stone. With that, I um stop my talk and any questions i i can't see slack right now if, unless i exit okay thank you shujin um we're right about a time uh we probably have time for one question jamie it looks like there are a couple questions that have been preliminarily answered so maybe we'll leave it at that and just have you um, go to slack and continue answering from there yeah sounds good Thank you, Xu Jin. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to Berkeley Gallo. We'll be presenting on exploring regional FE3-based configurations during the 2020 virtual spring forecasting experiment. All right. Thanks. Share. I don't see anything to share quite yet. Okay. Perfect. I just shared that with you, Berkeley. Yep, and do you see my slides in full screen? Looks good. All right, awesome. Biggest hurdle passed right there. So yes. thanks everybody for uh, sticking around for this talk. We're going to pivot a little bit from some of the workflow and, and those technical aspects to evaluating some of the forecasts from these experimental uh, FV3-based configurations. This is a huge effort. Uh, there are a lot of co-authors listed there, but that doesn't even encompass everyone who was a part of getting all of these models uh, available for the spring experiment. All right, Let's see if my slides will change. There we go. So for some background, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the 2020 spring forecasting experiment is an annual experiment. Uh, Adam Clark had a talk on the overview of this particular year's experiment this past Monday afternoon. But basically the main goals of the experiment are to accelerate R2O, O2R efforts and foster collaboration between researchers and forecasters. So the image on the right is what it usually looks like. We're all in a big room together talking, looking at forecasts, making experimental forecasts of our own based on model guidance. Um, but this year, things were a little bit different, like a lot of us are, are experiencing right now. So we decided in mid-March that we were going to be shifting the experiment online, and it, there was a huge team effort to put this, uh, to pull this off. So what it really looked like was more like Adam image. So um, we had our participants go off and complete independent model evaluations after a forecast briefing of the previous day's weather. And then we'd come back together after about an hour and discuss what participants had seen in the models. 
They rotated between two groups throughout the week because we did have a number of evaluations, too many for one person to get through in one day. So we rotated everyone so they saw the whole suite of model guidance across the week. And really the goal to bringing this online was to ma maintain our momentum in those key research areas, the SAR FE3, which unfortunately I'll be using SAR throughout this presentation, I'm sure it'll be LAM next year, uh, but also our other CAM ensembles and the Word on Forecast system. So this is what our participants would look at during the 2020 spring experiment, just as an example. We would give them a sweep of model guidance and then there would be observations to compare against. All models that we'll be looking at today are initialized at zero Z. And we asked participants to look at the composite reflectivity and updraft helicity, which is what's pictured here, at three separate times to try to reduce the workload and really identify um, critical things that we can see with one time as opposed to across the whole 24 hours or 36 hours. We rated environmental fields as well. So we looked at the two meter temperature, two meter dew point, and the surface based cape. And in addition to just the observational fields of those or the model fields of those, we also had difference fields this year, which made participants more able to see persistent or systemic warm and cold biases. We asked our participants to rate using a scale of one, very poor, to 10, very good. And to keep in mind uh, how a forecaster would use this guidance when forecasting severe convection. So the results that we'll be looking at today are from those scale of one to 10. And we're going to summarize three separate comparisons that participants completed uh, for the experiment today. So let's jump right into our deterministic flagships comparison. This comparison is really a bake off between the state of the art guidance from different modeling centers. So pictured, we have guidance from GSL, from the UK Met Office, from DFDL, NSSL, and EMC. And really, there's um, not so much a controlled comparison here. It's just how is your guidance doing compared to soon to be operational guidance, which in this case was the HER V4. And so for specific details on these configurations and the rest of the configurations that we'll be looking at today, I'll refer you guys to the operations plan uh, at that web address. And so everything is laid out in the operations plan um, because we do have quite a few CAMs to keep track of throughout the spring experiment. So diving right into the results, uh, the composite reflectivity and updraft helicity results really showed that while the medians at all times were similar, the means, which are those squares, are higher in the HER V4 than any of the individual FV3-based models. At later times, if we're just comparing the FV3-based models uh, to each other, the NISL FV3 SAR had a higher mean than the guidance contributed by EMC or by GFDL. Although again, medians for the most case were similar and at 18Z, all of the FV3-based camps performed very similarly. Looking at the environmental variables, these differences were a bit smaller than what we saw for composite reflectivity and updraft velocity, but they did show similar trends. And what you can see uh, in this comparison a bit is that our zero Z environments tended to be dominated by convective processes. So we had convection ongoing, the simulated storms were putting out cold pools. And so it, the environment was really tied uh, somewhat to the actual convection and, and the storms after the storms got going. So I think you really see that in, in some of these later evaluations. We also collected comments from our participants in addition to the one to 10 ratings. And so here's just a sampling of some of the comments. The GFDL FB3 participants noted that the cold pools and the cape did quite well pretty often. But overall, for the FB3 based models, there were cool and moist biases. And we've seen this for the past couple of years, although I think it has improved a bit. We also see a low bias in our instability compared to our analysis fields. And then conversely, with the herb, we did see a little bit of the warm and dry bias mentioned by our participants. The next comparison that we'll look at is uh, the FE3 star physics, DA, and vertical levels comparison. So we've got four models in the, um, the four leftmost panels and then two sets of observations on the right. Storm reports are overlaid, so those red triangles are tornadoes and the green circles that are somewhat eclipsed are hail. And so for these comparisons, the top two panels are similar but use 
different physics suites. The panels in the middle are essentially the same, but use different numbers of vertical levels. And then the EMC SAR versus the EMC SAR DA, the DA version adds hourly an hourly DA cycle over the six hours prior to forecast launch. So we really have in this experiment a set of three nice kind of one-to-one -one comparisons that we can look at differences in these specific configuration aspects. So when we look at the composite reflectivity and the updraft helicity at all three times, and I'm showing one time at a time now, really the differences are uh, pretty similar across time. So I'm going to just stick on the 23Z and we'll take a closer look at that. When we check the different physics, the EMC FB3-SAR-X physics did perform better than the EMC FB3-SAR throughout. And those physics in the SAR-X are the same as in the NISL FB3-SAR. And it, so if you look at those two comparisons, that blue and then the light purple, those seem to have pretty similar distributions. When we look at the different vertical levels, the performance here is nearly identical. Uh, the EMC FB3 SARX with 50 vertical levels does have a higher mean earlier, but then the NISL FB3 SAR has a higher mean later. So there may be some dependence on time as far as the importance of increased vertical levels. And then when we look at the DA, um, the DA did not perform as well as the EMC FB3 SAR at all times except for 4Z. But if you'll note that N number at the bottom, this really was a bit of a limited sample size case. So I would take the results of the DA version with a grain of salt. And we asked our participants also what model performed best overall uh, through the entire forecast cycle. And for the most part, participants liked the NISL FB3-SAR and the EMC FB3-SAR-X that had those more advanced physics packages. When we look at the environment, here is our environment at 18Z, not a huge difference. And then at 0Z, similar trends, perhaps a little exaggerated. Again, we're seeing the FB3-SAR-X performing better than the FB3-SAR, especially at this later time. Again, perhaps convection uh, related to ongoing convection. Very similar performance between the vertical levels again. Uh, the initial FE3SAR with the higher amount of vertical levels did have a slightly higher mean at both times, but that, that distribution was pretty close. And then again, the, with the DA, here we see the DA actually performing better at the later times, but again, we've got that limited sample size to consider. Our final comparison that we will be looking at is this FE3SAR initial conditions, um, diffusivity, and land surface model comparison. So you'll notice for this, our four models that are on the left are different. We repeat the EMC SARX in that upper right-hand corner, and then we've got our observations in the lower right. And so what we did here was we took participants' ratings from the FB3 EMC SARX and reminded them when we asked them to rate that this is what you rated this model. So it kind of gave them a baseline, um, lower amount of work that they had to do in rating the models and allowed us to um, just have this clean, consistent comparison. So here, uh, if you look at the different columns, they have different hoard options, which are different diffusivity. So that hoard equals six is more diffusive, and that's in the center, hoard equals five is less diffusive. If you look at the different rows, those are different initial conditions. So the top row is GFS initial conditions, and then the bottom row is her initial conditions. And then comparing uh, the top center model and the EMC SARX, those were configured similarly, but they had a different land surface model. And GSL did contribute these models uh, that were over on the left, and then the one on the right was contributed by EMC. So again, really emphasizing how many different agencies are putting a lot of work into these uh, comparisons. So we're again going to step through our three different times. Here, the differences are probably largest at 4Z, so uh, we don't actually really see any differences until we get to 4Z, with the exception of that fb 3 SAR X performing the best overall. With the different diffusivity comparison, um, which is those lighter colors versus the darker colors, generally the lighter colors or the Horde 5 are higher than the Horde 6, so less, less diffusivity is performing higher for both initial condition configurations. 
the different initial configuration comparison, which are the reds and the blues, we tend to see that the GFS initial conditions are higher than the HER initial conditions. And again, this is for our composite reflectivity and our UH, so actually looking at uh, the storm structure. We did have a few more GFS initial condition cases available, um, but not near as, as much of a, a difference as some of our other comparisons. And then when we look at the different land surface model, it does seem like the NOAA land surface model uh, is performing better than that rock land surface model. Um, so that's what we see from that comparison. Looking now at the environment field, so again, thinking about our two meter temperature, two meter dew point, and our surface base cape, there's 18Z and then 0Z. We do see larger differences at 0Z compared to 18Z, and again, see the same pattern where the EMC FE3 star is performing best. The diffusivity really does not seem to make a difference when we're looking at our environmental fields here. There's almost no difference in these things. The initial conditions, however, actually show the opposite result of what the UH and closet reflectivity showed. So here, the HER initial conditions are performing better than the GFS initial conditions, although those means still are quite close. Uh, and this was something that the participants noted when they were just subjectively uh, looking at, at, at the surveys. When we look at the different LSMs, again, we are seeing that that NOAA land surface model is performing better than the REC for the environmental fields, as well as for the composite reflectivity. So overall, we did see similar results to UH and composite reflectivity, except for those initial conditions. So just to sum things up, um, after having these models in the spring forecasting experiment for the past three or four years, I've really been impressed at the pace of the development of FE3-based CAMs. There has clearly been a ton of work that has gone into them, and I feel like each year we really do see an improvement uh, in how they're performing. So props to everyone who has been working on that, many of whom are here. It seems like the largest uh, types of changes that had the impacts on our subjective model performance were using the advanced physics. So that seemed to have a pretty huge impact uh, throughout our comparisons. Using the NOAA land surface model also seemed to have an impact, although it's not quite as large as those advanced physics. And then increasing the vertical levels also seemed to have a bit of uh, an impact, but it was mostly at earlier times. And then the initial conditions one, uh, I have that sideways arrow there because it did make a large difference, but sometimes it helped the models and sometimes it hurt the models. So it was kind of a mixed bag of results there. We did still see a persistent cool moist and moist bias in most of our FE3 based cams, but it does seem improved from prior years. And a key thing to keep in mind with these evaluations is that they are subjective evaluations. So of course, to complement these analyses, we need to be doing objective verification. And I know some of our partner agencies are doing that. And then we also do a lot of objective verification and the off season between different experiments. So that's still to come. We also have a summary report coming down the pipeline that will be available on the spring experiments homepage, which is here. Our goal is to have it complete by the end of August. And it will encompass not just the evaluations that I've talked about today, but all of the evaluations that we did throughout the spring forecasting experiment. So uh, at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any on the Slack, uh, or if not, there's my email address. So feel free to drop me a line. Thank you. Thank you, Berkeley. Great presentation. Um, Jamie, I think we have a couple questions. We have time for probably one. Okay, well, I'll focus on the question. There's a nice comment from Jacob Carley, so please take a look at that. Um, the question from Zhu Guang Wang is, Lu showed Monday that W from the SAR is systematically larger than ARW in the WAF context. Has this been observed during HWT experiments? I don't know that we've specifically seen large differences in the W. We do see large differences in the updraft helicity in that the climatology of UH from the FB3 based models is much higher. Now, whether that's due to the updraft or due to the helicity, I had primarily thought it was due to the helicity, but we've been talking to Lou and, and Larissa and some of those folks. And so I think we'll probably be making climatologies of UH and climatologies of W uh, just to see if we're seeing those large differences. That's a really good question. All right, thanks, Berkeley. All right, thanks. 
We'll uh, move on to David Wright. We'll be presenting on using an asynchronous coupled atmosphere lake modeling system to improve lake effect snowfall forecasts over the Loration Great Lakes region. All right, thank you. Can you hear me and see my slides? Yes. All right, hopefully that's the last time we have to hear that for a while now. Um, so before I begin, I want to thank uh, my co-authors on this project. I also need to thank um, the scientists at GSL and EMC who have been very uh, influential in getting this project off the ground. So to start with, if you've seen a Lake Effect Snow Talk, you've seen them all, but um, we will harp on this again. Basically, Lake Effect Snowfall is pretty challenging to accurately capture in numerical weather prediction. Um, a lot of it has to do with the width of the snow band features themselves, which typically can be on the order of less than five kilometers. Um, if we zoom in on Lake Superior here, you can see a lot of this fine scale de details in these bands um, that's on the scale of, you know, of order of a couple kilometers here. Um, and those are precipitating, so those are snowfall producing. So capturing that in some sort of operational forecast, which only has um, a couple kilometer grid spacing is a bit challenging. Um, part of the other problem is, is that they, these features are very sensitive to the lower boundary condition, uh, specifically the lake surface temperature themselves and the ice placement uh, within the model in that lower boundary condition. So accurately capturing that can be a problem. And most current operational models uh, rely on sort of a static lake surface temperature over the entire simulation, which causes problems as you go out past about 24, 48 hours. And in the winter time, you have very rapidly changing lake surface conditions. Um, and most of the lake surface temperature measurements are done via satellite or remote sensing, which in the Great Lakes can be a problem. This obviously is a picture um, that'd be great for remote sensing of lake temperature. You can see all the lakes very clearly, but most of the time what happens is you get something that looks like this, where you have a very strong cloud deck over the entire area. Um, you can sort of make out Lake Superior up here in the upper left, but then you know a more typical case is something like this. And the Great Lakes are typically in the winter covered by clouds. A lot of that has to do with the latent and sensible heat fluxes coming off the lake, producing that cloud cover, making satellite measurements rather challenging to accurately get. Um, another thing, just to hammer this point home a little bit, is this is um, the GLC product. This is a satellite-based product um, from the Great Lakes Coast Watch. Um, and you can see I've highlighted here that those are pixels with observations taken within plus or minus 10 days. So over 11% of your pixels in this region haven't seen a good satellite pass in over 20 days. So you can really start to get a degradation observational values uh, during certain times of year. So to get around some of this, we propose using sort of an asynchronous model coupling technique. This is where you basically take your atmospheric model, you feed it into some sort of lake hydrodynamic model, and then use that to then refeed back those surface conditions that produces into your atmospheric model, and you cycle over this every cycle. Um, and this has a lot of advantages where you're not directly coupling um, the two models together. So what you can do in an operational sense is you can have your both models run on two separate computers. So you're distributing your computational resources very nicely. So you're not worried about um, using too many resources on something that might be computationally expensive. Uh, we have done this in the past on a different project, working with her to get these FECOM um, surface conditions into her itself. And we have a uh, paper coming out on that. So to do this, to add some sort of value into those lake surface conditions, we propose using FBCOM. This is the finite volume community ocean model that is typically run over the Great Lakes region as part of the Great Lakes operational forecasting system next generation of that. This is, um, as you can see, a close-up of the grid here. It goes about um, sort of that triangular mesh grid, uh, about a couple of tens of meters near the coastline. So it's very high resolution here. Um, and then to couple that um, sort of loosely into FE3 LAM. And so we did this um, for a couple of times. So here's our FE3 LAM configuration. Uh, we're using a three kilometer horizontal grid spacing, 50 vertical levels. The vertical levels are approximately what the HER is using right now. 
Um, and then this is fed with wrap initial and boundary conditions. And we're also using GSD version zero physics for this. And this is for a 60 hour simulation um, from a couple of years ago. And we also did three sensitivity tests with this um, coupling technique. So the first is just a control. This is just going to be using uh, the initial wrap data that's going to be that have the RTG SST over the Great Lakes um, to initialize that surface condition that's going to remain static throughout the entire simulation. Then we have a static lake surface temperature simulation where we use the FVCOM uh, CI's data to bring in the lake temperatures and ice conditions, but we're going to keep that static throughout the simulation. So we're not going to allow that to evolve with time. Then finally, through some fancy coding, we've um, added some dynamic lake surface temperatures into the FE3 LAM. Um, and this is going to hourly update that lake surface condition. So that's going to be lake surface temperatures and lake ice coverage is going to be hourly updated in the simulation. And so just to give you a sense of how quickly things can change, this is over the 60 hour simulation. So on the far left is going to be hour zero and then the far right is going to be hour 60. And you can see over Lake Huron, we have um, sort of this extensive ice formation that builds up by hour 60. So there's rapidly developing ice conditions in this and also on sort of the Western portions of Lake Erie, you also get rapidly developing ice as well for the simulation. Um, and just to give you a sense of how the lake surface temperatures look, this is again gonna be sort of comparing our Great Lakes um, GLC data set here. You can see from our control to the GLC, the pseudo observations here that um, the control case actually initializes far too cold, specifically in Western Lake Superior and, uh, excuse me, Eastern Lake Superior and Western Lake Huron. It's far too cold in these simulations where the stack and dynamics sort of capture that as um, a little bit better, that temperature distribution. And if we go out to forecast hour 60, you can see again that control hasn't changed at all and it's lost a lot of the uh, cooling that happens in Lake Erie over this time period and some of the cooling that also goes on in the western part of Lake Huron. So to show that a little bit better, this is the dynamical lake conditions at forecast hour 60 minus the control at forecast hour zero just to see how much these temperatures change. And you can see sort of a, um, a significant difference again in eastern Lake Superior and western Lake Huron in the overall temperature. You're talking a temperature difference of upwards of about two degrees Celsius in a lot of these areas where Lake Erie is cooler by about one to two degrees Celsius in some areas. And that's significant when you're talking about uh, lake effect snow and you want to calculate the um, latent sensible heat fluxes off the lake. So getting those correct is a bit challenging. Now, just looking at sort of the dynamic condition itself, how these temperatures change over time, um, you can see Lake Erie is cooling by approximately one degree Celsius over this entire simulation. Um, not too much cooling or change is happening in the Western uh, lakes in Superior and Michigan, but getting those correct is crucial for a lot of things. So these, these two lakes will set up a lot of what happens um, further inland in Huron, Erie, and Ontario. It really likes to prime these areas for lake effect snow formation and give sort of preferential treatment for placement. So if you don't get those correct, it sort of cascades downward from there. So it's key to really get those correct. So what does this mean for snowfall forecasts? Um, in the um, FE3 LAM, basically in all of these, don't look at this too closely. Um, it's really hard to pick up the differences because um, it's very aggressive with its snowfall amounts. There are some changes that occur um, in sort of what Eastern, um, off the east coast of Lake Erie that I'll show a little bit closer here. But overall, um, what we're finding is that th it's just a little too aggressive with the snowfall formation in these cases as compared to sort of the snow dust um, variables here. But if we take a look and we start comparing these simulations to show what each one does, this is going to be the static, so just the regular FVCOM uh, snowfall amount at forecast hour 60 compared to the control. You can see what happens with that change in lake temperatures. You really start to change sort of the placement of these bands. Um, specifically, Lake Erie is the best example of this, where you now sort of get a formation of two separate bands that are a little bit more concentrated, a little bit more focused in different areas there. And then you also have some changes 
sort of emplacement and intensity downwind of Lake Superior versus the control. Now the dynamic case shows a very similar sort of um, result, but the values are a little bit lower. So it allows for that cooling of Lake Erie to occur, which is going to sort of reduce those snowfall amounts um, there and there. If you can if you compare the dynamic to the static, what you really see is by going to that dynamic, having that dynamic boundary condition update in that ice formation, you can really start to reduce overall snowfall amounts and really concentrate uh, where that snowfall is going to be occurring, which is really important for forecasters in the region to get sort of a better detailed view of where that snowfall is going to be occurring and intensity of it there. So having that dynamical lake boundary condition really helps to sort of focus in those bands and where they're going to form and um, how they're going to evolve with time. Uh, and then finally here, uh, we did a quick comparison. This is to an older runs that we have done with WERF. This is going to be a sort of a comparison between FE3 LAM and then the WERF that we did was a um, replica of the HER version. And what we noticed so far, and obviously this is for one case study, so this is not a universal applicable thing, but basically FE3 LAM tends to be a little bit colder in two meter air temperatures uh, throughout most of the domain. Um, and specifically over the lakes themselves, they tend to stay pretty much colder than what the WERF was forming. Um, and the results of this is then higher sort of latent and sensible heat fluxes off the lakes themselves, which I think is partially it's what is causing um, FE3 lamb in these cases to be a bit aggressive with the snowfall amounts um, because you get that sort of greater difference between the lake surface temperature and then the air temperature itself, allowing for those fluxes um, to move on. So. Um, to conclude, again, this is obviously for one case study, but FE3 LAM overall is a bit too aggressive with the snowfall amounts, at least as we're seeing it right now with this configuration. Um, dynamic LSTs do alter the lake effect snow forecast across the region and do um, provide a little bit better sort of um, guidance on where that snowfall is going to occur. And again, compared to the worst simulations, FE3 LAM tends to produce a little bit colder temperatures or land and water, which results in sort of greater um, sensible latent heat fluxes in a lot of cases. Um, and just real quick, in future work, um, we are interested in sort of running this setup um, at one kilometer resolution. So this is hers, so this is worth based um, but I think it really illustrates the point of what one kilometer horizontal resolution can really get you. Specifically over Lake Superior, you have much finer detail that forms just by going from three kilometers to one kilometer. Um, in this. So we're really interested in going that one kilometer because that's going to give you a little bit better sort of uh, morphology of the lake effect snow and give you a little bit better precision of where those bands are going to form and um, dump the snowfall. So that's part of the future work. We also want to um, test using the NOAA MP, see if that can help um, some of our simulations as well. And with that, I will take any questions. All right. Thanks, David. Any questions for David in the Slack channel? I think I see one. Yeah, we have one from Jacob Carley who asks, did your FE3 LAM run use similar physics versus the WARF run? So it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. It's obviously not comparing apples to apples. It's as close to apples as apples as we could get with the physics packages. So we're using GSD version zero, so this is going to have the RUC land surface model in it, which is going to be a pretty good comparison then with what the HER was running. So um, it's about as close as we can get without um, doing sort of a just copy and paste FE3 into the simulation. So we have another question from Shia Sun who asks, I may have missed this, what is the hypothesis for the aggressive snow water amount in FE3 LAM? So in this case, we think, or at least the early um, hypothesis is that um, the colder temperatures in the FE3 LAM are causing for greater sort of latent and sensible heat fluxes, uh, which is going to cause more aggressive um, convection to form in that lower boundary layer, which could then lead to more um, sort of aggressive snowfall in these cases. Um, that's obviously, this is a very early hypothesis and not been tested rigorously, but that's sort of the track that we're going on right now. Great, thanks. Um, that's all the questions I see for now. We do have quite a few kind of trickling in after 
the presentation. So I would encourage all of the presenters to continue to check the Slack channel as we move forward. And I'll throw it back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Jamie. So that concludes uh, the session and the workshop. Um, so I just wanted to send out a thank you to everyone. Uh, I think things went really well considering the circumstances. Um, we did have some technical difficulties, but I think we surmounted most of those. Um, you know, we had 18 sessions, 110 abstracts, and over 490 participants. So, and th this is our first, you know, 100% virtual workshop. So, I, I think it went really well. Um, so, I, I did want to share um, some pie charts that Ligia Bernardé set up to um, kind of show you the breakdown of affiliations for the participants. So, I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen. Oh. Thank you to, I'm guessing, Jamie, who threw that over to me. Okay, so let's see, where do we go? Let's move this out of here, this into here, and present. Can everybody see that? We can, thanks. Right, all right, let me go through. So um, this pie chart, there are a number of them actually, this shows all participants who registered for the workshop. You can see uh, slightly over half are from NOAA, but almost half are from outside of NOAA, which is excellent. Um, a huge chunk are from um, private industry and from the university sector, which is really great to see and a promising uh, aspect for the future of collaborative work with EPIC and for the UFS in general. Um, go to the next slide for all of the non-NOAA participants, this breaks out uh, where they came from. Um, again, a large uh, percentage from university, from NCAR, from the private sector, and uh, a number of others that are included here as well. Um, if you look at the university participants, it's all over the map, which is really great. Uh, just tons of universities in here, which is excellent. So um, even some outside of the United States. So. Um, this is, again, a really good sign for collaborative work and for contributions that are coming from outside NOAA for the UFS. Um, if I move on, uh, if we look at the NOAA participants, um, a, a large chunk coming from NWS and OAR. There are some other line offices in there. Um, so this is, uh, you know, a breakdown of that uh, division. Um, if we look at where they came from within NOAA, uh, a majority are, are feds, but there are a number of uh, collaborative institutes in here as well, as you can see from Ceres, CIRA, IMSG. Um, and then within the non-fed uh, division, again, uh, IMSG and Ceres uh, and CIRA are in here, but there are other um, collaborative institutes as well, as you can see, uh, that make up these divisions. Um, and then from the private companies, again, like the universities, just a ton of different uh, companies who are uh, represented here, uh, which again is great for uh, collaboration and for the future of, of the UFS. Um, and then we, we even had some people from uh, international uh, locations, uh, 12 registrants from China, Brazil, um, India, and um, the Space Application Center, which I'm not sure where it is, but based on the spelling of center, it would probably be uh, Canada or the UK. If you're in the UK, I apologize, it's nearly midnight. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is great to see um, so many participants from uh, outside NOAA, from universities, uh, from the private sector. So I just want to thank all of these participants uh, for contributing. And I did want to see, Ligia, if you had any comments you wanted to add to your pie charts that you came up with, which, which are great. Thank you for, for putting those together. Let me see if, if she's muted. Oh, no, she's not muted. Um, no, thank you, Jeff. I think you did a great job of covering the pie charts. OK. So thank great. you. So again, I wanted to thank all the, the presenters for the excellent presentations, all the participants for the engaging conversation, um, questions and your patience while we work through some of these difficulties. Um, you know, most of the sessions went slightly long, but probably no longer than they would have in, in person, which is, is a great success, I think. I want to thank all the chairs and the moderators for all their amazing work and, and the help um, with each session with GoToWebinar and Google Meet and with Slack. And the technical support at NCAR from Laura Giadi, uh, Jenny Bolton, uh, for their help with the websites and, and the communications 
to all, all the emails we need to send out. Um, I want to thank the organizing committee, which includes Wei Wei Lee, Ligia Werner Day, Catherine Newman, Jim Kinter, Jan Shu, Lisa Bankson, Ben Liu, Cecilia DeLuca, and myself. Uh, we've been working on this for over a year. Um, and, you know, over a year ago, there was no such thing as COVID. And uh, we were planning this as an in person workshop, and, and we had to completely rework and overhaul the whole thing to have it online. Um, I think things things went fairly well, um, considering all the changes we had to make. Um, I did want to announce that we're planning to keep the Slack workspace open for continued discussion, so we have no plans to take that down. Uh, whether we decide to keep that up uh, until the next workshop, I don't know, but we, we have no plans to, to do anything with it. So I definitely encourage people to continue the discussion online there, um, and everything will be saved, so uh, all the conversation that's taking place won't be lost. Uh, we'll also be posting the, the presentations on the private agenda website. We'll link those to each um, presenter. Uh, so hopefully we'll get those online soon so you can download the, the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we'll be sharing a survey uh, soon that will come from GoToWebinar with a number of questions related to uh, the workshop. Um, and that'll go to all participants uh, requesting your feedback. Um, I also wanted to add that uh, we do have the OSTI PI meeting, which is going to take place tomorrow from 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, the agenda for that is at the end of this workshop agenda online. Um, so you can go and, and see that um, on the website. If you're interested in attending, everyone is, is welcome to attend. Um, I don't see Jan on. I was going to see if she wanted to say a few words about that. But since I don't see her on, um, those are all the announcements and comments I wanted to make. You know, I'm looking forward to another great workshop next year. Hopefully by then we can do it in person. Um, and um, that's, uh, that's everything I had. I, I guess I'll throw it back to anyone else on the organizing committee or uh, the chairs and, and uh, moderators if they'd like to, to make any comments. So Jeff, this is Louisa. I, I, I was going to add just a couple of comments. Is that okay? Sure. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So I, I just wanted to commend everybody for um, putting this together and pulling it off, um, especially the organizing committee to have to turn on a dime to kind of go from what we were hoping was going to be an in-person event to one that was totally virtual. Um, I, I have to say, I, I had my trepidations about how it was going to go. I, I really, the exploration of technology and the use of the Slack channel um, to sort of emulate what would have taken place for an in-person in where you would have had discussions during coffee breaks and and your lunch break and stuff like that. I mean, I, I think it was, you know, the best we could do. Um, it's it's definitely, I've, I've been perusing uh, some of the conversations in the Slack channels and, and um, I, I was really glad to see that type of interaction. Um, so so excellent job troops um and and just to echo jeff's thank yous to all the different categories of people who helped out um i did want to also acknowledge that um we had so many registrants that we were originally going to go with um go to meeting for everything um or google meet sorry <laughs> um and then we had too many people to accommodate that and so I wanted to acknowledge that Comet let us use their um, GoToWebinar license uh, for um, the last three days. Uh, so the organization, UCAR, uh, came together and we were able to um, be able to pull together resources and, and pull this off. So thanks to them. And, and finally, I just I do want to encourage everyone to um, fill out the survey so that we can get some feedback because we are hoping this is going to be an annual event. Um, so give us give us some feedback about how this went, um, what you thought worked well, um, what you would like to see different, that kind of thing, because that's always helpful um, to be have the feedback from the participants um, when you're going to plan a subsequent event. So thanks, everybody, and um, just stay healthy and safe, and hopefully we will be able to see lots of smiling faces in person next year. Thanks. Thanks, Louisa. Thanks. Any other comments? 
All right. If not, we'll conclude. Thank you all again. Look forward to seeing you all next year.